All right, in this section, I would like to talk about how we actually get to load data into Spark. Spark is capable of reading all the standard formats like CSV, JSON, or binary files like Parquet. Also, it supports loading data from SQL databases via JDBC. In this video, I will walk through reading some of those prominent data formats into Spark data frames. Before we actually start doing that, let's first have a quick talk about how data can be represented in Spark. Um, you have already heard me talking about Spark data frames, and this is the recommended data structure for Spark. It is very intuitive to work with if you already know about pandas, R data frames, or SQL. Um, there's also another low-level data representation called RDD, or Resilient Distributed Datasets. However, it is rather unlikely that you're going to use those, and since the official Spark handbook, Spark the Definitive Guide, recommends using data frames, we will stick to those. Um, next, let's talk about where you can actually store data. Of course, you could just read in data from the local file system. Note that for this to work, the data must reside on the same path inside every single node of your Spark cluster. If you have three nodes in your cluster, the data must reside um, inside the same path on all of those three machines. Another very prominent way of storing your data is inside the Hadoop distributed file system, or HDFS. Once you've set up HDFS, it is actually pretty easy to put data into it via a single command. Hadoop will take care of distributing it. Also, you might run your cluster inside the cloud, and for this, Spark also supports reading data from prominent storage solutions such as Amazon S3 or Microsoft Azure's Bob Storage. You can easily access them by making just a few configurations to your Spark application. The difference between them in terms of accessing them is just the path name. First, let's start by loading CSV data inside the Spark user's home directory. First, let's start by loading CSV data inside the Spark user's home directory. First, let's download some dataset from the internet we would like to load into Spark. I think the Titanic data is a good first example since it has different data types. So just Google Titanic data and click on the result by the University of Stanford. So I'm just gonna do that as well. So open up Firefox. We just Google Titanic data. And there should be, yeah, there is University of Stanford. And here you can just copy the link for the data set. Um, don't click on it, um, since we want to download that into the Spark users home directory. And if you would click on it, it would download it into your personal users home directory. So just copy the link location. All right. And that is done. Next, we move into our terminal and download the data via the wget command. So again, so notice that I'm inside the Spark user's home directory since I'm logged in as the Spark user. So we're gonna say wget and insert the link and I just downloaded the Titanic CSV data. Let's fire up an interactive PySpark session. Um, if you don't have a running cluster, first start Apache Spark and then connect to it via the PySpark binary. So I already have a running Spark cluster and I'm just gonna connect to it. So we're gonna say Spark bin PySpark and the master is, let me look up the master. So we know that we can access the web UI via localhost colon 8080. There it is. So it's spark colon slash slash Debian 707, 7077. All right. Finally, we are greeted with a Python prompt so we can start coding. Remember that a connection to our Spark cluster has already been made and it is saved as the variable Spark. So we have this variable over there. We can now use methods on that variable to actually read in data. So let's read in the Titanic data set. So we're gonna save that to a data frame called Titanic. And we say spark.read.format is CSV. I'm gonna do some line breaks here to format it nicely. Then we set the first option, which is separator. And that is a comma. Just gonna set the second option, and that would be header, and that is the Boolean value true. Then another option, and that would be infer schema, and that is also true. And 
Next, we're just gonna load. And here I put in the file path to our Titanic CSV file. All right, so it's loading. Okay, so again, here I included some line breaks so that this single command is more readable. So again, this, what I've typed in is just a single command. Now, first we are calling the Spark variable. Remember, this variable was created for us while starting the cluster. This variable represents our current session on the Spark cluster, and we can use that variable as a starting point to interact with that cluster. Next, we use the read method on that variable. This way, we tell it to read data. Afterwards, we declare the type of the data we would like to read in by using the format method. Here, I just enter CSV as a string. Following that, we set some options. Notice that uh, this is like a key value format. The first argument is the key, and the second argument is the value. And as you can see, I tell it to treat a comma as a separator. We tell it that the CSV file contains a header. Also, we tell it that it should infer the schema for us. This is very important. If we would not set this option, it would default to false. Hence, all the columns would be read in as strings. And we don't want that. We want string columns to be parsed as strings and numerical columns to be parsed as numbers. Finally, we use the load method. Inside that method, we give a path to the file we would like to read. And the most awkward part might be the file colon slash slash part. And this is where we tell PySpark what kind of file system we actually want to access. Following that file colon slash slash, so I'm talking about this right over there, um, follows the simple path on our system. So in our ca case, it's slash home slash spark titanic.csv. You might find that overly complex to write, so why not use the simple file path? Well, remember what I've told you about the different file systems Spark can read data from. Let's say your data resides on the same path, but not inside the local file system, but on HDFS. The only thing you would have to change is file colon slash slash to HDFS colon slash slash. So if the Titanic data set would reside on HDFS, we would simply say, all right, the path is this. So let's say we also have a home directory and a Spark folder and it's inside this Titanic CSV file, right? So then it would read from HDFS. We assign the result of that code to the variable Titanic. This will be a Spark data frame and we can use methods on that data frame to interact with it. You can always take a look at your data by using the show method. It takes two arguments. The first argument is the number of rows you would like to receive. In a big data situation, your data frame will have millions or even billions of rows. And hence, it's a good idea to limit um, that to a reasonable number. The second argument takes either true or false and uh, you can use it to trim columns. If you have too many columns to show properly on your display, you can tell Spark to just cut them off. So I'm not going to set any arguments since I'm fine with the defaults. So let's take a look at the data. All right. Notice that Spark uses lazy evaluation. That means when you enter a PySpark command, it might perform suspiciously fast. The reason for that is that Spark will execute the command only when it really has to. For example, if you ask Spark to show data. Um, for that, Spark will have to make all the calculations you entered before. So if our Titanic data set was multiple gigabytes of uh, size, the show command might have taken a while to execute. However, as you can see, the data was read incorrectly. Um, we could also have a look at the schema of our data frame by using the print schema method on that data frame. So we could say, let me clear the screen, we could say Titanic dot print schema and as you can see um, it parsed numeric columns as numerical types and string columns as strings so for example age is a double um, name is a string survived as an integer um, spark did that since we set their infer schema option to true now how would reading in json data work First, you might ask how the result would actually look like. Since JSON data might contain nested data, it doesn't naturally lend itself to a data frame representation, right? 
However, Spark data frames not only have primitive ty data types like strings or numbers, uh, it columns uh, can even store more complex data types you would find in JSON files. Let's first create an example file inside the Spark user home directory. So I will open up a new terminal, log in as the Spark user. So we are now inside the Spark uh, home directory and we will create a new file. So we're gonna just call it example.json and we open that with nano. Okay, so inside that JSON, I will now enter some data and this might be the result of an API call, for example. So I'm gonna enter square brackets and then follows a dictionary name. John Doe, then job, and that is another dictionary. So the title of his job is manager. His salary is, let's say, 4,500. And his hobbies are, and that is a list. So it could be swimming and music. All right, that's John Doe. Let's enter another colleague. So her name might be Jane Smith. Her job is the following. So the title is, she's a data wizard. And her salary is, let's say, 5,000. And she has hobbies. And those are, let's say, dancing and travel. All right, let's enter another one. So his name is Alex Miller. His job is, he's a TPS report designer. His salary is 4,800, oops. And he has hobbies. And those hobbies are travel, and internet. However, he also has pets. And that is a list of dictionary stops. So the first pet's name is Mr. Bell. And the type of pet is a cat. And the second pet, his name is Rufus. And the type of pet is a dog. Dog, not. All right. So those are his pets. And that was the last one. So let me just check that real quick. Yep. Okay, I hope I didn't make any mistakes right here. So that should, yeah, that should work. All right, let's exit and save. So we have our JSON data. Now a few things to note about that file first. So let's, let's have a look at that file again. And let's just pipe it in there. So <clears throat> a few things to note about that file. First, notice how this is a multi-line file and how we put all the records into a list. Now, this is valid JSON. Every dictionary represents a person. Every person has a name, a job, and, a, and hobbies. Note, however, that Alex Miller also has a list of pets, and inside this list are dictionaries containing information on his pets. Everyone has a job, and that information is held as a dictionary. 
pretty nested data. Will Spark handle such cases? Well, let's give it a try. So we've created the data. Let's go back into our terminal or our Spark session. Let's try reading that in. So we're going to say, OK, this is a data frame, and we call it people. And we say Spark read dot format. Of course, this is not CSV now. It's JSON. And let me do some line breaks here. So next, we're going to say option. Oops, multi line is true. And option. Uh, oh, sorry, no option. I'm just going to load the data. And it's located, of course, on the file system. It's in the home directory of the Spark user. And it is called example example.json. All right. Let's read in the data and let's show the data. All right. That looks good. So as you can see, we get back a data frame. Also note that some columns have nested data types. So let's uh, look at the schema to confirm this. So we're just going to print the schema again. So people.print schema. All right. So the same would hold if you read in data from NoSQL databases like MongoDB. Notice how I added the option multiline and set it to true. This was necessary since we had multiline data, of course. So what about binary files? Spark starts shining when it comes to binary files. And one of Spark's native for binary formats is Parquet. And it is a very efficient column-oriented format, which makes it especially suitable to store large amounts of data. And we can give it a try by loading some example data from the internet. Now go ahead and Google um, example Parquet files. And I'll do that as well. So I'm going to say example Parquet files. And there should be a GitHub link. Yep, right over there. And there's basically some example user data. And we can copy the download link for those. So I'm just going to take the first one. And then I just click on the download link and say copy link location. Go into the shell that brings up the best shell where we are inside the um, Spark users home directory. And then I just download the link via the, or download the data via the wget command, right? That was downloaded. So let's do that for all of them. Let's also get two, three, four, and five. So copy link location, wget. Let's get that. Let's do the same for the third part. Copy link location, wget. Let's take the fourth part. And finally, let's do it with the fifth part as well. All right. Oh. So if we ls, we see we have user data one dot parquet, two dot parquet, three parquet, four parquet, and five parquet. So all the parquet data. Now let's put that into a folder. So let's create a folder called user data. And let's move that into the user data folder. If we now ls again, we will see that the data has vanished and we now have a folder called user data. And if we take a look inside that folder, we will see that it holds the content or all the files we've just downloaded. All right, next let's hop into the PySpark shell and read in the data. So first I'm just gonna read in uh, a single file and we say data is spark.read.parquet. So reading parquet failure um, data is actually quite simple. You just say spark.read.parquet and give the file path. So home spark user data and we're just gonna read in user data one.parquet. All right, that was pretty fast. Now the syntax for loading Parquet files is pretty easy. And since the schema is already included inside that file, we don't really have to set any configurations. So I think Parquet files are pretty neat. And we can of course take a look at the data. So data show, oh, okay, that's quite a lot. Um, so let's do the same and let's say 10 rows and let's 
trim the columns. Okay, that looks much better. So the data was read in. Now the syntax for loading parquet files is pretty easy. And that is because the schema is already included inside that file. So we don't really have to set any configurations. Note that up until now, we have only read in single files. In a real world big data case, your data might be distributed across multiple files, such that they are stored in the same folder. For example, maybe you get a single CSV file containing usage data for every single day. You can read that folder just like a normal file. As an example, let's, let's take that user data we just downloaded from a GitHub repository as an example. So um, you can see the data is split across multiple files. So let me show that to you. So the user data is split across multiple files. We have user data one parquet, two parquet, etc. So we can read in the folder user data just as we would read in a file. Again, the user data folder is not a single file. It is just a folder containing multiple files where the schema is always the same. So it's basically one big table split across multiple files. And we can try to read in that folder just like we would read in a single file. So let's say data underscore folder is equal to spark.read.parquet, so nothing changes. And the path is just a path to that folder. So it's the Spark users home directory, it's user data, and that's pretty much it. So as you can see, I just give the path to the folder. Hit enter. Now we can of course have a quick look inside of it. So you can say show, give me the first 10 rows and trim the columns and it worked. Now in order to check that it really worked, let's count the number of rows of the data data frame. The one that only contains data of the first parquet file. And let's do the same for the data frame that contains data from the entire folder. So let's say data. So this is the data frame that contains only the rows from the first file. And it says we have thousand rows. And let's do the same for data underscore folder. So this is where we read in the entire folder. And it says 5,000 rows. Now here you can see that data folder has much more rows than data. This should come to no surprise since it, since it contains more files. We might not always have our data in files. Many times our data resides in actual databases. And still the most common type of database today is a SQL database. Since the data inside a SQL database is relational, we can easily load data from it and put it inside a Spark data frame. And for this, we are using JDBC or Java Database Connectivity. This is a driver that allows us to connect to a whole range of SQL databases. And for the following example, I have set up PostgreSQL with a tutorial database. And in that database, there is a table called dummy that holds some example data. Now you can do this example with any other SQL um, table, of course. When you install Postgres via a package manager, a user called Postgres is automatically installed on your machine. And this will be the default super user for Postgres. I gave that uh, user the password test, both for Linux and for accessing PostgreSQL. Now let me show you the data in Postgres so that you know what we are looking for. Now notice that I am not in the PySpark shell any longer. I have closed that down and I'm now in a shell locked in as the Spark user. Now what we're gonna do is um, we need to fire up another terminal and lock in as the Postgres user. So let's enter su hyphen Postgres. And now I'm just gonna enter the test password. Next, let's enter psql, which is the command line interface for Postgres. Oh, sorry, psql. And I am now logged in as the Postgres user inside um, psql. First, let's list the databases that are currently uh, running. So, slash l. And here you can see a database called tutorial. I created that one for us and we can use that database by running slash C and then tutorial. Um, PSQL informs us that we are now using the tutorial database. Let's list the available tables in that database. So DT. And there's one table called dummy, which holds some dummy data that I've created. I also tried to play around with the Titanic data a little bit, but I, I opted for um, a simple dummy table. 
All right, let me show you what's in that table. So we're gonna say select star from dummy. So this is just a simple SQL command. And this is the data inside that table. As you can see, it's nothing fancy, just a few rows with only two columns. Now let's exit PSQL and proceed with reading in the data into Spark. So I'm just gonna exit that and I'm not gonna use the Postgres user any longer. And we can close this down and go back to our terminal where we are logged in as the Spark user. Now go to the web browser and go to the following web page, HTTPS colon slash slash jdbc dot postgresql dot org. So this site, this is the site that holds the drivers and you can click on download, then current version. And we are just gonna download the most up-to-date version and we are using jdbc 4.2, that should work. Right click and then just copy the link location. All right can close that down. And I would just enter our known wget command and insert the link. So it's downloading a jar file. As you can see, we are downloading a jar file which contains the package Java code. Now, when we are creating our Spark shell, we must point it to the JDBC driver. All right, let's start our PySpark shell. So for that, I'm just gonna start the cluster again because I closed that one. So I'm gonna say spark sbin start all. If your cluster is still running, you can of course just um, skip this step, but I've closed mine down. And next we're gonna create a PySpark shell. So we go into the Spark folder again, bin and PySpark. Now we gotta give it the master and that one is, I always forget the, let me look that up. So we know that, yep, there it is. Okay, this is the master. Okay, so if I would hit enter now, it would create a PySpark shell on my master, which would work. However, we need to include the jar that contains the JDBC driver and you do it like this. So hyphen hyphen jars, and then just give the path file to our, oh, I should I should have a look how oh, it's actually named. So there it is. It's the PostgreSQL yada 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 dot draw file. So again, so I'm gonna fire up PySpark. The master is located at this URL. Then we gotta include the jar. We do that by jars and then give it a path to the jar file. All right, hit enter. And now we can access any PostgreSQL database that we can connect to. And the syntax to do that is actually pretty similar to what you've already seen. So how would I load the SQL table uh, with, containing the dummy data. Well, it's actually pretty simple. Now let me clear the screen for you. So let's save that to a data frame called SQL underscore DF. And you say spark.read.format and the format is not SQL, the format is JDBC. I'm gonna do some line breaks here. Then the first option we're gonna include is the URL to our Postgres server. And that would be JDBC. Postgre colon postgresql colon colon slash slash localhost since it's running on localhost it's not running in the cloud it's running on my pc on port 5432 and then we put in a slash and the name of the database we want to use we want to use the tutorial database all right some more options so the next option we're going to include will be db table and that's the name of the database table we want to access in our database. And we are accessing the database tutorial and we want to have the table dummy. All right, next option, the user we want to log in as, and that would be Postgres. So we're using the super user account. And remember, I set the password to test. And 
Whoops. One last option, and that would be the driver we want. We would like to use. So, driver is arc postgresql dot driver. And the last command, we tell it to actually load the data. All right, so the data gets loaded and we now have a Spark data frame called SQL underscore DF. Now let's peek inside that data frame to check that everything has worked out as we have hoped. So SQL underscore DF dot show. Fantastic. We can now load data from our SQL database. Of course, the same holds for other SQL databases like SQL Server or MySQL. And in that case, you just have to download the right JDBC driver for your database. You can even check that it has converted the schema. Yeah, as you can see, the country is in a string value and the value is an integer. Perfect. Now, th that should cover the most common use cases. We have read in data from CSV files, JSON files, and Spark Native's binary parquet files. And we also read data straight from a SQL database. And with that knowledge, you can come a pretty long way. However, there are drivers for a whole bunch of different data storage solutions. For example, there is a driver which allows you to read data that resides inside a MongoDB. And I would highly encourage you to take a look at those.